Welcome to the Work Hard, Play Hard podcast. My name is Rob Murgatroyd, and I'm a former doctor turned lifestyle entrepreneur. Each week, I interview some of the best minds on the planet on the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. Come take this journey with me. Excuses are over. It's time to live. I was the kid that went to a basketball camp, and if they had a six o'clock extra coaching segment, I was going to that at age 12. You know, a lot of athletes go through some kind of addiction once sports are over because you lose that massive competitive fire that was driving you. And, you know, a lot of times people turn to addiction to kind of soothe those feelings. Usually when most people write down all their goals, Nine times out of 10, your push goal is going to have to do something with finance. Okay, before we jump into this interview, I want to invite you to be considered for my 2019 Traveling Mastermind. So go to workhardplayhardmastermind.com and fill out the application and we'll jump on a call to see if you're a great fit. This year, we'll be in Boston doing lots of cool things like training with Tom Brady's trainer, Alex Guerrero. In the middle of the year, we'll be heading to Monaco doing things like vintage car rides through the French Riviera. And then we're going to wrap the year in Florence, Italy, doing things like truffle hunting and hot air ballooning over Florence. Look, Life is all about fulfillment, and I really try and walk the walk. So if you are looking to be part of our tribe of 28 high-achieving entrepreneurs that are in the six- and seven-figure range, fill out your application at workhardplayhardmastermind.com to be considered. So think of the mastermind as having two parts. The first is the trip itself. And the second part is what goes on over the four days within the mastermind. Our group of 28 entrepreneurs will help you brainstorm and accelerate what you want to achieve in 2019. And we'll do that through a variety of different exercises, brainstorming activities, breakout sessions, goal setting sessions, you know the drill. So go to workhardplayhardmastermind.com, fill out an application, and we'll jump on a call to see if you're a fit. All right, let's jump into today's episode. What's up, everybody? This is Rob Murgatroyd, and welcome to another episode of the Work Hard, Play Hard show. This episode features Brett Johnson. You can find him on Instagram and elsewhere at Brett Johnson 11, the number 11. So Brett Johnson, along with his wife, Shalene Johnson, created a company called Team Johnson. That's a lot of Johnsons in one sentence, but I am a big fan of their company. I got turned on to their company when I heard about a product that they created called The Push Journal, which many of the listeners of this podcast are familiar with me talking about because it's freaking amazing. It has single-handedly allowed me to create the clarity that I needed to exit my chiropractic company and create my mastermind company. It was that powerful to me. I mean, I got up every morning at 5 a.m., looked at this journal, visualized exactly what they wanted me to visualize, and like magic, uh, within 90 days, all my wishes came true. It was like uh, rubbing Aladdin's, I almost said belly, but his lamp. We dug into a whole bunch of areas with Brett from mistakes that they have made in their businesses to marriage counseling. And we talked about how to live a really fulfilling life when work creeps in constantly. I have wanted to do this interview for a long time with Brett. And I knew that when my wife and I bumped into him and his wife, Shalene, in a heliport in Monaco, that it was a sign that this needed to happen. So here it is. Before we jump into the interview, a lot of people have been asking me about private coaching. And yes, I am doing private coaching, but it's only for people that are ready to make a change. Not thinking about making a change, but are ready to make a change. If you fall into that category and you feel like we might have some synergy together, go to workhardplayhardcoaching.com, complete an application, and we'll jump on a call to see if you are a good fit. Okay, please enjoy this conversation I had with Brett Johnson. Brett, welcome to the show. Hi, Rob. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. 
I am so good. You know, I am super excited to do this interview because we share a lot of the same friends and I have heard so many things about you that we finally have a chance to talk. And what's amazing about this for me is you were on my mind because I reached out to you to do the interview. And, you know, as luck would have it, we both wound up uh, taking a vacation to the same place. Not only were we, were we in the same place at the same time, but we ran into each other in the same heliport at the same time in the south of France in Monaco. I mean, like, what's the chances of that? Well, the, ch- the chances of that are, are very, like, I would say 1% because we weren't even supposed to be there. We decided, which is a great benefit of being an entrepreneur and, and signing the front of the check, as I say, we were in London and decided that Paris was going to be too warm. They were going through that massive heat wave in the summertime. And we just relocated to the South of France. So literally we weren't, when we left the States, we weren't even going to the South of France. So that's even tells you a little bit more how crazy it was to, you know, run into you in the heliport. Wow. So absolutely crazy. All right. What we'll do is I'll explain to you a little bit about the show. First, we'll talk about the science of achievement and how you and your wife have been able to help entrepreneurs in the way that you help people. And then I'd like to move into the art of fulfillment and maybe talk a bit about some of the things that you and maybe uh, your wife and your family, et cetera, do to help you feel more fulfilled. And then mm-hmm. we'll wrap it up with some rapid fire questions. Cool? Sounds great. All right. Awesome. I think a good jumping off point would be to take you back to the 70s in Los Angeles. How would you describe what growing up in your house was like with your parents, Debbie and Bob, and your younger brother, Rob? A lot of, a lot of Bobs and Robs in your family. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the 70s, huh? Yeah. I mean, you know, you were born in early 70s. So yeah. So, you know, so I think probably I would pick that up probably towards the later part of the seventies when, you know, I, I, I grew up in a household that there was one income provider and it was my father who was a school teacher slash football coach. And my mom was a stay at home mom. So I think in that respect, we, we look like a lot of middle America at that time. But I I grew up in a family that didn't have an entrepreneur background. None of my, none of, none of their parents were that they worked in steel mills. They came out here from, from Pennsylvania. So it was really kind of not, uh, very, very structured, very, um, the dad was 100% the, what he says goes, there wasn't any talking back. There was no debating. There was like, it was his way or the highway type of thing. And, you know, we picked that up, my brother and I very early. And, um, we both were obsessed with sports and not one sport like, like the kids these days, but we literally played football, basketball, and baseball. And whatever season it was, we were all in and that's what we did. And that's what, at that point we thought, okay, we're going to be pro baseball players or, Oh, we're going to be pro football players or, Oh, we're going to be pro basketball players. And we literally just, it was a big sports family, lots of competition. Everything was a competition. What brought them from, uh, from PA to, uh, to Southern California? I believe my grandparents moved this way for work, for, you know, a better opportunity. My, I think my grandfather was able to get like a management job out here. He worked in down in Long Beach and my mom's parents relocated out here from New York. My, my mom's parents were divorced. Um, I never really met my grandfather on my mom's side and they lived in, they grew up in Redondo beach, California, which is a city, probably about 15 miles south of LA and right on the beach. And, you know, they, they kind of had that, those same core values and that, you know, that's just the, this way it was when we were growing up, I didn't know any different, you know? So I didn't know, uh, I didn't understand like how people own their own businesses or anything like that, which is a hundred percent opposite of my wife. Shaleen grew up in an entrepreneurial background. So it was kind of like when we met, it was totally the opposite mindset. 
Yeah, that must have been a fun marriage in the beginning, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, you know, we, we, I saw her doing this. So whenever she, she had a job as a paralegal when I met her in college, but she always had side hustle. She always had that because her father was a serial entrepreneur. And so she always had that. And, you know, I dabbled in it once we got back out here to California and, and my football career was over. You know, I started like a quarterback coaching business and and my dad had that as well. And I kind of took it online and, and, and grew that. So I, so I, I, I saw that she was doing it and I was interested in that. I was, I knew that I wanted that life for, you know, for Shalene and I and for our, our eventual family. I want to back up a little bit and we'll, we'll kind of go forward from the seventies to the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned that you and your brother became, well, you didn't mention this, but my research showed this, that you, you guys became one of the best football high school quarterbacks in the country. Mm-hmm. The question is, what did you like most about that? And what did you like least about that? I think what I liked most is that I got attention from my father. You know, as a young kid, and I've done a lot of therapy to get to understand this, but as a young kid, you you know, you want your approval from your parents, you know, right? I think everybody does. And I think my dad being such a a huge figure. I mean, he was, he, he just retired two years ago as the second winningest high school football coach in California history. And number one down here in orange County where, where I grew up and he was kind of a larger than life figure. And not that, not that if I wouldn't have played sports that he wouldn't have loved me just as much, but back there, back then as a kid, you, you see it as like, Oh my gosh, if, if I do this well, I get this great amount of praise from my father, which was kind of addicting. And I think that there was, I I really wanted to be the best at that. And I really just kind of fell in love with the art of like, when I say working out, I mean like playing, you, you know, like I wanted to get better. I was, I was the kid that went to a basketball camp and if they had a six o'clock extra coaching segment, I was going to that at age 12, you know, 13. I, I, I was always, I was already aware of like how hard it, t- how hard you have to work to get to college football and then obviously on to pro football. I mean, I, I was, I was well aware of the hard work that it takes and I, I was willing to do it. So I, I didn't mind that. I I actually liked that. So, so the second part of that question is what didn't I like? Yeah. I think now looking back on it, I probably don't, I didn't like the fact that I probably gave up on a lot of things that I could have done. You know, like I, I hear people now like saying, Oh, I did this when I was in high school or I did this when I was in college. And you know, I didn't have any of those experiences. So I kind of, I, I kind of, you kind of have to give up one for the other. I, like I, Shaleen is always laughs at me um, because I, I, like I didn't have toys when I was growing up. Like it, people <laughs> laugh at that. Like you just laughed. And like, yeah. I don't remember any toys like, or like watching television shows. And like, I wasn't big into like music or anything like that. I lit, I literally like woke up in the summertime and if I wasn't going to the beach, I was like going to the park to shoot baskets. So that was kind of my deal. Well, you know what's interesting about that? You may not have had an entrepreneurial family, but certainly you had an entrepreneurial drive or programming, I would suspect, for success just by you know that determination and grit that it took you to create what you created with sports. No? Yeah, I, and I think to be a, a good entrepreneur, you have to be a little competitive. And I think also the fact that the position I played at quarterback was very, it's very strategic position. And I also was a point guard. So everything that I did growing up was very strategic. I was always kind of like the coach on the field. So I, I always had like leadership role. So I think there's lots of things that I did in sports that helped that out once I transitioned to be, you know, more of an entrepreneur and like grow that. So I, I think, I think definitely those those characteristics helped a lot. All right, I want to go over to I want to talk about Michigan State. You eventually wound up attending Michigan State, and that's where you met your now wife, uh, mm-hmm. Shalene. Can you take me back to the conversation that you had 
about maybe sort of like set the stage for why you guys decided to jump in your Honda and move across the country to California. It didn't take much convincing. I don't, I, I think if anybody here has ever met Shalene or, or listened to Shalene, they're kind of in shock that she's from Michigan now that when they, she says that, that cause she, she looks like some, a California girl, but she has those Midwest values. I think the first time that she knew that we were moving out here was I, we had been dating for about a year almost a year. And we came out here in like the spring slash early summer and down here in Orange County, you know, it had been snowing and that, that gross time in the Midwest where it's like, and everybody that's lived in the Midwest knows what I'm talking about. It's that, it's that gross time when the, the, the sun hasn't come up enough to like get everything to bloom and it's like muddy and it's brown and it's like it rains, but then it might snow still it was like right after that time. And, you know, that depressed me like that, that was, that was hard for me being from California and like not seeing the sun and like seeing this doom and gloom. And when she came out here and like saw that it was like sunshine and just all the opportunities out here were so crazy. And a lot of the things that she wanted to do, I think it was a a really easy decision. It wasn't difficult at all, you know, her, but you know, she had to leave, she was leaving her family, come out here, not know anybody, start a new career and new jobs and all that kind of stuff. She thought that she was going to go to like a uh, law school, you know, so she, she did all that pre-planning and then that never panned out. She, she realized that she didn't want to go down that route. And, but it didn't take much convincing to be honest with you. Um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a big discussion. It wasn't like a turning point in our, in our dating life or anything like that. It was like, I'm, I'm going back. So let's go back together <laughs> type of thing. And she's like, there's sunshine and it's me and I'm there. Yeah, let's do and, it. and I think she saw a lot of opportunities out here too, you know, being, an, being that entrepreneur that she is, I think she saw like, you know, how many people are out here and, and just different trends. And I think that excited her as well. All right, so I'm going to move into the uh, to the area that everybody tells you you should talk about in the cocktail conversation. That's to talk about religion and sex. Are you cool with that? Sure. <laughs> You'll understand why I'm asking that question in a second. You guys talk a lot about the importance of your faith in Christianity, and you clearly have no judgment. Certainly, Shaleen, and you know, probably you, no judgment around you know gangster rap or being gay or mm-hmm. anything like that. Do you ever wrestle with that? And this is a question that I'm I'm asking really for self-interested questions. Do you ever wrestle with having the faith that you do in Christianity and at the same time, simultaneously liking things that aren't so Christian-y, let's just say? Can you kind of flush that out a little bit and maybe talk about that? Because I know that there's a lot of people that struggle with you know, stepping into certain, you know, certain types of uh, religious practices, et cetera, because, you know, they don't, they don't like people who are gay or they, they wouldn't like gangster up. But you guys are really, really cool about being very dug into your faith and simultaneously saying, you know, they may not believe this, but I do. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, and for those people that don't agree with Shalene and I's viewpoint on that. And I think that's respectful, respectful too. I think everybody has to make the decision for themselves. I'm in the camp where, where here's, here's how religion came into my life. I, I never went to church as, as a kid. Um, I didn't grow up in a faith based home. We, We, you know, it was, it was, it was sports. I mean, literally when in people might go, well, what did you do on Sunday? We went, we had basketball tournaments, you, you know, we just didn't practice that. And I think my parents, you know, try to instill in us, you know, integrity and be honest and, you know, the characteristics that come along with a, with a religion, you know, to be good to people, you know, treat people like you want to be treated and, you know, all that, all those things. But in, it wasn't until I actually went to church the first time that like, I was like, this, this makes a lot of sense, but what never made sense to me was like alienating people. Like I didn't, I didn't understand that. And I, I think that's just me because I grew up differently, right? I was raised differently. I was, I wasn't raised like, like, 
by the Bible. So, you know, I just, I, I feel that, you know, everybody's created different. Everybody has their own viewpoint. And I, and I just don't think that it's right for people to like, I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to, to kind of describe. I just think people interpret things the wrong way. Like it's perception, you know, and the, and the bad yeah. thing about perception is, is that people really think it's like true and they don't really get to know the person or, or why they feel this way. And I just, I've just seen too many people like, like you, you mentioned it, like, you know, Shalene and I's viewpoint on, on people that are gay. Right. Well, I don't, I, my personal opinion, and, and there might be, you know, 50% of the population that totally disagrees with me. I don't think that you choose to be gay. I just can't, I, I've seen too many instances where it's just like, it's, that's not possible. I, I just don't see it. I don't, I, you can't convince me that people, w- you know, wake up and at 10 years old or 11 years old, they're just like, you know what? I've decided that I'm going to be gay. I don't think that happens. And I, and, and you might disagree, but I'm. No, I agree with you. I agree with you completely. I mean, like somebody once said to me, when did you, when did you make the decision to be heterosexual? I'm like, I never. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I, I get it, you know, so I, but I think that's, I think that's such a great answer. And that's, that's one of the things that I love about you guys is you're really, really clear on your values and you're open to uh, lots of different things. Let me ask you a question. Let me um, ask you a question, Rob. Yeah. Because this, this, this yeah. would be my, this would be my hypothetically, because I know this has happened because I've heard people say this before. So you go to a family reunion, let's say it's Christmas time, right? And you see, yeah. and you're there and you have a huge family and there's 20 cousins there. Right. And, and Rob got a football for, for his, for Christmas and he's 10 years old and seven of the boys are just fired up. Your cousins, you guys are ready to go. There's a big yard. You guys are going to go play uh, flag football and you guys are going to tackle and you're going to have, you're going to do quote unquote, like what 10, 11, 12 year old boys would probably want to do a Christmas with a football. Correct. You follow yep. me here. Okay. And now yep. there's another boy that's a cousin and he's eight years old and he has no interest and I'm not saying that you can't, that all football players aren't gay because there are football players that are gay as well. It's been perfectly documented and in, in people coming out. But that eight or nine year old boy has a tendency where he would rather go play with dolls, something that's a little bit more like you would think that is in the girl realm, you know, like you, you would see all the cousin girls playing with, with, with dolls and such, right? Now, yep. Is that what would be your interpretation of that? Because I've I've witnessed I mean, that you know, before, and and, yeah. and 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 you know what? I'm not saying it's good or bad or whatever, or encourage it, or but the parents that when I witnessed it encouraged it and didn't say, you know what, you need to go play with the boys. You need to go play with the boys. They no, it was just a person. That's what they were drawn to. Now I don't know if that person turned out to be gay or not, but. You know, it's just at that point, the kid is eight years old. He chose which way to, you know, where to go. He didn't want to go play with the boys and play ball. He wanted to go play with the dolls. It's just, it's just people are different. Yeah. I mean, what's, what worse yet is the parent who, you know, smacks him on the bottom and says, go out there and play football and put the, put the damn dolls down. And then the kid just, then the kid just winds up hiding in the closet and doing it. You know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. So we're, we're, uh, we're drinking the same Kool-Aid here for sure. Yeah. So I just think everybody's, everybody should be treated fairly. That's, that's, that's my stance on it. I just, I, I just don't think that, I don't think one way is the right way. No, nope, it's never been that. that way. All right. So switching gears, I want to talk about sex. <laughs> okay. So I, and the reason why I'm, I'm asking this one is because I was, uh, in doing my research, I saw that you, uh, you liked a, uh, a post that your, your, uh, your wife recently did or a podcast that she did and it was on sex. Uh-huh. And the question I have is what are the key lessons that you've learned? How long are you guys married now? 24 years. All right. It's a long time. What are the mm-hmm. key lessons that you guys have learned about keeping that area alive? I just celebrated last week my 13th year 
um, anniversary. And, you know, look, like any, like, you know, there's a lot of people listening to this and, you know, when you, when you first get in the relationship, you know, it's the honeymoon stage and, you know, you guys are, uh, you guys are going at it like, uh, like you should in the beginning, but then as time goes on, that's not the same way that it was. And since, you know, you, you guys are, are open to sharing things that you've learned and, you know, you work on, you work on different areas of your life. How would you sort of, you know, give somebody advice that, you know, has been married for 10 years, 15 years, whatever. And that area is just not where it needs to be. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, it's funny that you said this. We just posted a, um, a, a, on stories, on Shalene's stories, question, yes or no type of podcast about this subject. Because Shalene gets a lot of messages that like, you know, they, they're not having sex with their spouse. And, and like, it's been months and it's just like, I'm not into it and I'm tired and it's this. So, you know, she started to dig in a little bit, but for, for, for Shalene and I, it's always been about keeping it like spicy and doing things that, you, you know, at the beginning when you have kids, you know, having a date night, and I've talked a lot about this, a date night isn't, you, you know, come home at six o'clock at night and say, hey, you know what, I, um, let's call a babysitter and go out to, uh, out to the movies or go, you, you know, you, you were like, wait a second, but that's a date. I go, no, that's not really a date. That's just, you, you know, you decided to do something kind of at the spur of the moment type of thing. A date night is something where you ask your spouse, whether it's the, you know, female, male, whatever it is. Right. But for me, let's say I'm, I'm going to take Shalene out and I'm even to this day, I'll say, Hey hon, let's go on a date Friday night. And here it is Wednesday. And just by now you're, now you've just thrown it all the way back to where pre-marriage, because most of the time people don't plan it that way where it's like two or three days in advance. And I mean, and people are like, well, we have kids. Well, it's, it's so important. It's more important when you have kids to have date nights because they're, they're going to see that role modeled and it's only going to be make your marriage better, which is going to make your family structure and your family environment even better. So you are really doing yourself a disservice if you're not doing date night. And so I've always put together like this, you know, plan in my head and I've taught it before on podcasts and, uh, and I've talked about it before is like, you, you have to court your spouse every day. I mean, I do. And I think that has, has benefits in the long run in your sex life. I mean, we can you know, whether we are going to have sex that night in the middle of the day or whatever it might be, there is constant attention there is constant like flirting. There is constant touching. There is constant, you know, uh, appraisal. There's constant compliments. So, I mean, that's just me. That's the, the, and Shalene, that's w- what we've done. And people might be like, oh my gosh, that's gross. I've been married for like 15 years. Well, guess what? You're probably not going to be married for another 15 years if you don't start doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Has it always been that way for you guys? Is that just kind of hardwired in you or is that learned from uh, lessons? No, I think that it's been that way from from the outset. I, I think we've had lulls, like every you know, like everybody else that you go through sometimes, and where you're building your business, you're raising kids, and there there might be some some um, seasons where you know it's probably not as active as it was the previous season, but you know it's something that we're definitely concentrating on. And there's definitely, when we feel out of rhythm, we know how to get back into that rhythm of, um, you know, dating and flirting and, and doing things that are, that, you know, get us back to, like you said, that honeymoon stage. And yeah, I love, I love, I love how you describe let's go on a date and the, and making the distinction between what a date night is and let's go on a date because let's go on a date is what you're going to ask somebody before you marry them while you're yeah. dating them. So yes. I love, I think languaging and syntax, et cetera, is really, really important. So I love that. One of the things that I really, really love about the content that you guys uh, put out and I'm sort of like, I'm, I'm directing it some to Shalene, some to you, but because I know you guys are, you know, I'm, I'm treating you sort of as one in this, in this yeah. part of the show. Uh, totally you guys have a bit. Okay. So 
You have been super open about struggles that you've been through. For the benefit of people that you know, may find themselves in your shoes, could you talk, if you're open to it, about how gambling affected your relationship and maybe how and what EMDR therapy is and how that helped you guys get through that, that uh, rough patch? Sure. I basically was addicted to gambling. Not basically, I was addicted to gambling. And it was at the time when we were growing our businesses and, and eventually trying to sell our businesses. And I didn't know that, that sports and when sports ended for me, that, you know, a lot of athletes go through some kind of addiction once sports are over because you lose that massive competitive fire that was driving you. And, you know, a lot of times people turn to addiction to kind of soothe those feelings. And I say that now because, and obviously I didn't know that like during the height of my addiction, but, you know, going through, as you said, therapy and using a form of therapy called EMDR, you know, I was able to process that and, you know, work through those, those demons, so to speak. But but when when I was in my gambling addiction, it was horrible. Uh, it's it's um, the, one of the worst. Obviously, the worst thing that you can ever do to somebody that you love is to keep secrets from them. And you know that's basically what it was. It was she actually knew that I gambled. Like you know, we would go to Vegas, or you know, she knew. She just didn't know the the height of it. So it wasn't like she was like you're gambling. Like she knew, um, she just didn't know how reckless it got and she discovered it. And as soon as she confronted me, it was, it was literally like, it was one of the worst days of my life, but also the best days of my life. Cause it was literally like taking a monkey off your back and like, and not like a monkey, like a, you know, a 4,000 pound gorilla because I didn't have to hide this anymore, which was dr- which was causing so much anxiety and, and stress in my life. And now that it was open, now the worst part about that is now I've hurt my, my, my bride. Right. And now she had to like go through it and uncover and, you know, through therapy and just discussing with her, like everything that was going on. And so that was really hard to go to put her through that. But It also was, was very, um, I don't know what the word, what the word is. It's like, uh, it was refreshing, I guess, to just be done. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And you know, one of the things that I'm thinking, I'm sort of like putting myself in your shoes as you're telling this story. And I think the word that maybe you're searching for is relief that it was out in the open. Yeah. Number one and number two, now we can actually go about fixing this thing because now it's out. Yeah, because I, I had no to, idea how to fix it. it. You're 100 percent right. Relief and and how to fix it, you know, had to be done, and it was it was it was hard. It took. I did two years of EMDR therapy. So and people are like, "Wow, you did two years of EMDR therapy for 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 gambling?" I, yeah, there was there was lots of there was lots of things that I had to unravel and, and, and come to grips with and understand why I was doing it and why it made me feel a certain way. And, and it was, it was hard. Like that was hard. That was really hard work, but it was in the end, it was worth it. I mean, tenfold. I mean, I, I became a better, I obviously became a much better husband partner, but I was a good dad, but then I became a phenomenal dad, which was... Do you still do you still get the triggers when you're in certain environments? No. I was just in Vegas visiting my friend, and um, he's a, he was over there for a conference, and we were roommates at Michigan State, and I just went over there, and we, we actually went and played top... We had a good dinner and played top golf. And here, here's why I don't... I think I don't get the itch or, like, triggers or any anymore... Because when I was gambling, it was an amount of money that was exciting. You know, there was, I I would gamble 
an amount of money that if I won, it was exciting. If I lost, I still kind of like it, it was, there was enough money on the line where like it got my juices and it felt it, it gave me a certain feel in my stomach. Right. Yep. And at this point, I'm not, I would never be willing to bet that much money or gamble that much money to get that same feeling. Cause it would have to be a lot more and it just doesn't make any sense. So what mm. I've done, Rob is I tran which is, which is crazy. And it shows Shalene how, how trustworthy and how much she, you know, valued the fact that I put in the work and went to EMDR and, and, and she watched that process. But like, I still control the finances in our family and you're like, people are, your listeners are probably going to go, Shalene is crazy. Right. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I've, I've been able to just stretch our wealth so far beyond what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis, just through investments and making smart decisions with our money. Because what I did was like we talked about earlier, my background is being competitive, right? And doing research. And it was never about like, like how much money I had. It's just, I wanted to, I just wanted to do what was right. And, and, and I wanted to really, um, show her that like, I can channel this energy into some other field. And that's what I do. I mean, I, I, one of the roles that I have in our relationship is to make sure that our money makes money. And I do a very good job of that. And so that's, that's been kind of like, I've, I've been able to transition my gambling addiction into, and it's not an addiction because like, are you addicted to like stocks and stuff like that and bonds and all that kind of stuff? No, I just, I, I research it and I, and I make smart decisions and I re you know, I, I, I do tons of research. I watch like most people watch podcasts. I watch, you know, uh, CNBC and I read articles and all that kind of stuff because I think it's important for me to make sure that our money is making us money. So then when, when we retire, we can retire well and not have to like change our lifestyle up that much. Um, if we ever retire, I don't know if entrepreneurs ever retire, but so that's been, that's been kind of rewarding to me, to be honest, you know, I just like, I, I, I don't know if too many people have gone from a gambling addiction to the, the, the person that's in charge of making sure money grows in the family. And I teach it now. I literally will get on podcasts and teach people how to get out of debt and um, make money and where you can invest money and where, what, what's, what, what are some smart decisions based on like my, you know, I think there's a million ways to not a million, but there's hundreds of different ways to make money and make your money grow. It's just, I give my, you know, two cents on that and people can, you know, take it or leave it. But I think it's, it's an interesting concept that I'm still involved with money. It's just in a way more positive way. Well, listen, I mean, you know, the way you've explained it, I, you know, the, the, the name that keeps popping up in my head is Pete Rose. And I think that there was a very similar competitive sort of thing that happened with you and him. And when you uncover what that is, then all you got to do is just redirect, not all, but I'm, I'm, I'm not making yeah. light of it, but you, you know, your ability to redirect how you get that you, it's it's almost like you're getting the 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 high the dopamine hit that you need in a much more positive effective way and you're leveraging it for your benefit 100 percent. it's it's i love yeah, that it's exact it's exact you're exactly right and it's and it's fun and and the one thing that i know is this rob is that there's there's money to be made in the stock market in people that do these um i i don't even know anything so i might be even calling it the right wrong thing are like calls and puts where people actually like you you put you invest on if a stock's going to go up or down right to me yep. when i heard that that is now you asked it would i have a trigger that's something that i know going through emdr like i'm not even going to get involved with that i'm not even going to look into that i'm not even going to like try to research that i'm just like that seems to me like gambling and it might not be people might watch you know listen to this show and go that's what i do for a living i'm a day trader i i i put calls and puts it's the greatest thing ever that to me seems like gambling 
And it may or may not be, but in my mind, it does. So I completely stay away from it. I even told Shalene, she's like, what, what are these calls and puts? I go, I don't even want to know what they are. Like she was listening to my show one time. I was like, I don't even know what she goes. Why? And I go, because it just seems like gambling to me. And it, that seems like a slippery slope. Like I start doing like betting that Tesla is going to go down in two weeks. It seems to me like the same as betting that the Cowboys are going to win on Sunday. So I'm just like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> Um, Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about something that you may or may not know, and that is that I I picked up one of your products a few years ago, the Push Planner, and I am going to attribute that Push Planner with me. um, I've been a chiropractor for the last 25 years. I retired last year, and I am going to attribute using that Push Planner Mm -hmm to me leaving the profession of chiropractic and creating my next business, which is my mastermind. So just to give you a uh, a little reference point, this is a true story. I mean, uh, 100% true. I got the planner. I wrote at the top of the planner. I uh, identified what my push goal is. And for those people that are listening, the push goal is effectively the goal that will knock down the other goals that are on your list of 10 over the 90 days. And every day I took three actions that I had brainstormed out uh, previously against that, uh, against that push goal. And um, within, I just kept resetting it every 90 days for a year. By the end of the year, I had sold my practice and created a mastermind. I don't, I don't get on, I don't care where I am. I'm spending four months yeah. in Europe. I brought four push planners with me and I do it every single day. It is the most powerful weapon that I know of. And this is not just a push because you're on the show. You know that I carry it with me because I tagged you. Yes, for sure. It's something that, yeah, it's something that I use. So I do have a question. Um, We'll let people buy the push planner. A lot of people listening to the show have already bought the Uh push planner and they tag me with it, et cetera. But the question I have is, I struggle in one area with it, which is how would you recommend using the planner with a digital app that helps you manage multiple projects, like say a getting things done system app? I use something, I don't know if you're familiar with, it's called OmniFocus. Um, there's many of them that are yeah. out there, but are you, um, you know, I have so many projects that I'm working on. Okay, so, you're, so the question is how, how do you incorporate an app with the push journal? Yeah, and specifically, if you're familiar with the uh, the GTD system, the Getting Things Done system by Robert Allen, how do you incorporate that? And if you don't know that system and you're not familiar with it, that's fine. Um, I, I, I'm how not do you familiar with that it? system, but I can tell you how Shalene and I incorporate our cell phones and the Push Journal. Perfect. Okay, so we both do separate Push Journals. We have, and we also have. So those are goals and things that we want to accomplish. And then we also have ones together. And I don't know if you and your lovely bride do the same thing where, you know, you have your own business, you have your own things that you want to get done, whether it's with your, you know, because a lot of those, when you read through the push journals, you know, a lot of them have to do with relationships and friends and hobbies. And, you know, a lot of things, you know, you're not doing the same things as your spouse. But the things that we, you know, that we are working together and, you know, we come together with those and, and those are, those are more discussions. But to answer your question, when I go through my push journal, where, wherever I'm feeling like low on the, on those, uh, when I rate those things, I, you know, I move those things up priority list. I will, I will put notifications on my phone that reminders that, you know, let's, let's say hypothetically, I really want to improve my relationship with my daughter. I want to, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm pouring into that. Right. So I might put in reminders once a week, twice a week that I need to be reaching out to Sierra or whether it it might be Sierra, it might be Brock or whatever. It might be a, a relationship. It might be a friend. If it's something to do with business, then, you know, in, in my business, then I will hash all those things out. And you, you know, like you put in there that you, you do three things a day. Well, lot, sometimes those three things a day might be giving somebody else an assignment, right? 
So I have an extensive like to-do list app that I categorize into all those different fields, those 10 areas of your life. And when the area of the life is something that I don't need to be working on, then I don't, I don't go to that folder. But if it's something that I need to be working on, I'm constantly working that area of my life and there's notes in there. And I just, I just use, you know, an app on my phone that just helps me keep all that in line, whether it's, whether it's work or personal. So do you actually physically carry the book around with you where you write the push journal at the top and, and yes. write down three actions under it daily? Yes. So, and you know, there's, there's tons of room in there for, to take notes and to do things. Now I always, it's so much more powerful as you know, cause you, cause I mean, you've been going, you're on this vacation. I think you're probably, what are you six or seven weeks into it by now into this? Uh, we're we're a month into a four month trip. Yeah. Got it. So, and I've watched you journal in the morning and I'm sure what happens with you too, it's so much more powerful to write it down and to hash it out on paper and in, or in a journal. And then you look at it and you kind of organize your thoughts and then transfer it to the thing that you are always with, which is your phone. So that's yes. kind of the way I do it. So I will write down, let's say for instance, we have a, um, we have a launch coming up here in September, right. For one of our digital products. Yep. And so that's something that is in the business side. I really want to do, I, I want our launch to do better than the last one. And I take copious notes on exactly what I feel we did right and wrong on the previous launch. And then I write down exactly how I know or I feel that we're going to fix this, right? And then yep. once I get it all written down, then I can categorize it into things that only Brett Johnson can do, things that Shalene Johnson can do, and things that parts of our staff can do. And then once that's done, then I enter that all into my phone, and then I assign things and make sure that there's checkpoints and add, you know, you know, dates that things have to be done by. And that's, you know, I don't know, um, it, you know, if we want to get into how we communicate with our staff, but, you know, we use, we use a, uh, an app and a, a productivity app called Asana, which I'm sure a lot of people use. And yeah, so I will, that's what we use. Yeah. So I, I, I use both of those. So I, I use, so I'll use, so I'll have it all written down in, in my notes. Cause, and then I will transfer it to Asana and break it out there. And then the stuff that's personal, I just keep it in, in my own app. And then I assign it to my calendar when I want stuff done. Okay. Got it. I, I'm following you with everything, but I want to get a clarification on one thing. Yeah. And that is, did you mention that you guys have three journals, one for you, one for her, and one together? No, we, what we do is we do our own journals. To, we, we do our own journals. So I have a push journal. She has a push journal. And she does, she rates her 10 areas of her life, you know, and, and she does, we, we, do, we constantly do that. We do that once a quarter. And because the journals are a 90 day goal setting thing. So the, the, the premise of the push journal is, is that people used to take a whole year to get all their stuff done. And then they would forget, you know, by, you know, the third month, what they're even, what they were talking about in January or whatever. So our push journal is you can pick it up anytime. It doesn't matter what time of the year it is. Doesn't, you don't have to start it on the first of the month. It's just 90 days. And the, the premise of it is you're going to blow through your goals faster and faster and faster. So we do, one for ourselves, because, you know, let's just say hypothetically one area in your life we talk about is environment. Environment is just like your working surrounding and all that kind of stuff, right? Well, my environment could be amazing where Shalene's environment might not be amazing. And she needs to change it, right? But that's something that yep. she needs to do. I'm not really going to be a part of that. Then what we do, so that kind of answers your question in terms of we do those separately, right? Then together, once a quarter, we come up with a, like a push goal that we wanted. Like it's, it's like a together thing. And it's usually focused around something either that we want to do together, work-wise or personal. And then we, we, make, we make a plan on how that's going to get executed too and how it fits into our, you know, our personal goal setting stuff. 
Do you ever struggle with or have an issue where you have, I, I know the definition of the push goal is just one goal and it's not two, Yeah. but do you ever struggle with where you feel like I have two push goals? Yes. I, I, I think, I think most people do. I, okay. I think most people do. And, and I don't, I don't think that's wrong. Um, at all. I think that, I think there is one, if you really sit down and think about it, or you might even ask somebody, you know, what seems like the one that would tip over this one. Um, but there, but it could be something that's, that you're working simultaneously with, like, there could be a major, like, let's just go back to the environment thing. Let's say for instance, like you're trying to sell a house and it's really stressful in terms of like, I need to get this house done, right? I need to, I want to get this house sold. It's stressful. I have two homes. I want to get this one done, whatever it might be. Right. Or yeah. if there's a room in your house that you really want to get done. Well, and you know, that would, would score your environment a, a, a lot better, but there also might be like a work one that's more relevant, but there's still, there's still really low scores on your thing, on your, on your evaluation, but you, you know, the work one is more important in terms of how it will affect the rest of the goals, but you still need to pay some attention to that environmental goal. So why don't we call it like this, Rob? So when there's two goals, why don't we call it a one A and a one B mm. rather than two goals, like a one A, one B. So they're two, they're really important, but you are, you know, that the one A, like if push came to shove, like you're going to spend, you're going to get the three things done with one A before you move on to one B. How about that? Mm, that's really, really good. Okay. Last push goal question. And that is every single time I do the numbers, I guess because I'm an entrepreneur and I'm always wanting to grow, you know, one of the goals I have is to exit, to have a $10 million exit, right? That's a, it's a, it's a much longer term goal. Okay. When I rate the numbers in my life, mm -hmm. I'm always rating finances lower, even though I'm doing the best than I've ever done financially, I always rate it lower because it's not where I want it to be. So my push goal always winds up being a financial goal. It usually and does, Rob. What's that? It, it usually does. Usually when most people write down all their goals, nine times out of 10, your push goal is going to have to do with something with finance. Oh, good. Okay. All right. So I'm winning this game. Well, no, you're, you, you, you're, di right. you're dialed in. Um, <laughs> okay, it's cool. usually, it's usually has to do with finance or your push goal has to do with, you need more time. Okay. Perfect. So one of those two usually things that are, you know, and I think what the, the other thing about goal setting that is probably that you've learned because I can hear it in your voice right now, but probably the number one thing that Shalene talks about with goal setting is you, you have to attach a number to it or, uh, you know, for or sure something that's relevant. Like you can't just say like, gosh, my fitness and health, I really need to improve that. That's going to be my push goal for the next 30 days or whatever. Right. Or 90 days. And all you do is write down health and fitness, right? No, that's not what you do. You have to write down, I'm going to exercise five times a week or whatever number it is. I am going to only eat out once a week, you know, so you have to apply a number to it or it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You have to quantify 100%. it. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm with you. All right. So I'd like to move in for our remaining time left. I'd like to move into the art of fulfillment portion of the show and talk about some things that uh, you do to improve areas outside of business. So these questions may seem like they're coming out of left field. Just roll with okay. it. What is the new behavior or belief in the last fill in the blank number of years or months that has significantly improved the quality of your life? The belief that's crept in. Well, it's, it's definitely that I'm valuable in the role that I'm in, the, the role that I'm in and, and what I do for, family and business. So I'm, I'm valuable. I'm very secure with that. I can have somebody in social media tell me that, um, that I'm just, uh, um, 
you know, in a DM or something like that or whatever, and just say, Oh, you just ride the coattails of your wife or you, you know, your wife makes all the money or something like that, you know, like that. And you know, that might've six or seven years ago might've bothered me a little bit, but at th- this point in my life, I, I'm well secure with my role and what I do and, and the value that I bring to our relationship and then also our, our business together. I love that. Are there any opinions or positions in the last few years, or it could be way back, it doesn't have to be in the last few years, that you've changed your mind about substantially, where you shifted your position or you just completely went, mm, no, I feel different about that now? I think that I've, I've realized that there's, there's a lot of ways to raise kids and not every way is you know the best way or the right way. It's almost like we go back to that religion question that, you know, there's a, there's a million different ways to raise children and to raise good humans. And I think that I, I probably, uh, go back seven, eight years ago again, you know, we're doing a lot of this stuff that's like pre-therapy that I thought that there was only like one right way to do that and maybe a little bit judgmental. And now I kind of look at it in through different eyes where, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of our friends, you you know, might've gone through a a rough divorce and it's in their, their co-parenting and, and then how that exists and, and, you know, just different ways to, to, to raise kids these days. I think I, I, I had a, um, I had a set in stone type of way. And I think I've, um, I think I've lightened up on that and I, and I can see other people's struggles and, and that uh, how they're trying to, to manage today's, you know, society and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, th- I think, I think the way to parent your, your kids is, is probably one of the things that I've been enlightened on. I love it. Complete 180. If you could spend one month anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Well, I'm, <laughs> this is going to be funny. Cause I'm, I, I wouldn't have said this, um, uh, three weeks ago, but Shalene and I just fell in love with the South of France. And it's amazing. We, you know, we were there for six days and, um, she keeps on looking at me and going, okay, when are we going back? When are we going back? And so I think we, and we both loved it and, you know, six days and you've been there before you, you can definitely do yeah. a month there. So, um, I think that would probably be my one, a, my one B would be anywhere where it snows uh, every single day. And I could snowboard for one month straight in straight powder would be my second. That would be my one B. When you guys get closer to making a decision decision for the South of France, uh, let me help you with that. I have a lot of people in that world. Got it. If you could only go to one restaurant before you die, where would your last meal be? I think it would be, I love Mexican food. So it would probably be a, a place out here called Javier's. Mm, I know exactly where that is. Are you guys near Laguna? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So Javier's, the original Javier's is in Laguna. Now it's in Crystal Cove and they have one in, uh, they actually have one in Vegas. So if you guys ever go to Vegas and you're like, oh, I want to go try this restaurant that Brett would eat, this would be his last meal place. I believe they're in the Aria in at Javier. Yeah. But, by the way, you just implanted um, an imagery of that giant guacamole bowl, and I'm in Montenegro right now, and try and find Mexican food in Montenegro. It's not going to be... Yeah, uh, I know. Being in the from, form of Yugoslavia is not going to be... So yeah, easy. being from Southern California, I mean, it's it's hard to beat good Mexican food, and it's just, they do it right, and you know, I, I, I would know what exactly what I would order, and it would be good. Well, I'm super excited about that because when we leave Europe, we are moving to the place that you talked about at the top of the hour, which is Redondo. That's where our new home oh, is. Oh, great. Going. So we're super we'll be, excited. We'll be neighbors. Yeah, we're super excited. We will. We will. I'm absolutely really excited about that. With every new level comes a new devil. What are you currently struggling with right now? First thing pops uh, up. Our, our startup business, our nutritional business, um, the 131 method. Completely 100%. We have self-funded this project. It's a, um, I believe it's um, the way of the future in terms of how you should approach diet, nutrition, and fitness. And it's 100% goes 
against all diet, the diet industry, which is a multi, multi billion dollar industry that wants no part of you figuring out what you should eat and how you should eat because everybody's different. And that's what our nutritional program is based on. And as you know, the diet industry wants to tell you what to eat and how, how, how well has that been working out for America? Not, not too well. So we are definitely like salmon swimming upstream and trying to get this business so that, you know, it's a household name. And so it's, it's a struggle and it's also fun because it's competitive and, you know, we have lots of great ideas and we have unbelievable people working for us and we're meeting all kinds of great people that want to spread our message about the one, three, one method. And so it's exciting, but it's definitely a struggle. It's not like waking up and, you know, just walking out to the uh, mailbox and getting a check. That's not, that's nowhere near that is it's, 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 it's building. It's, it's like building a, a house, you know, from scratch. Yeah, for sure. And I can give an endorsement there. I am a 131 member and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing course, works really great on your iPhone. Yeah. Okay, so the last round of the show in our remaining couple of minutes is going to be an answer as quickly or as slowly as you would like round. It's basically a first thing that comes to mind. What would your friends say is one of your superpowers? Oh, my friends 100% would say my generosity with with money, time, knowledge. I'm just, I'm, I'm a generous person. What keeps you up at night? Just probably happiness of my kids. But, but to be honest with you, Rob, I sleep freaking unbelievable. I I really do. I'm at, I'm in a point of my life where I've released a lot of demons and, I'm very happy with where my kids are, but the only thing that gives, gives Shalene and I any kind of, I don't even want to use the word anxiety, but just gives us, uh, you know, something to talk about is if one of our kids are struggling and we are in no way, shape or form those helicopter parent lawnmower parents that, you know, want to take care of everything for our kids. We want them to struggle. We want them to, you know, to, you know, you never want your kid to fail, but we understand there's failures along the way. It's just when, when they're in something tough, then, you know, you, 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 you they're your, they're your children. So you, you, they're always going to be your kids. So I'm 100% yep, if, if they're, if they're having problems or difficulties that that weighs on me, but I sleep really well at night. What do people never ask you, but you wish they did? I don't mind you. You asked it and I don't mind talking about my gambling addiction. And I think probably people don't want to bring it up because I don't know, maybe they think that it would trigger or something like that. Even my close friends sometimes will kind of not, not my closest friends. They'll, they'll ask how I'm doing or whatever, but you know, people that know and have, you know, we've talked about it on podcasts. I've talked about it in this podcast. I talked about it on Chris Harder's podcast. We've talked about it on our podcast. I mean, people know. So it's like, um, if, if people are going through that, I mean, I, I would, more than happy jump on a phone call or, you know, send them an encouraging text. If people are going through some kind of addiction or something like that, I think people, I mean, I'm open to talk about it. You know, you asked me, I didn't hesitate. I, I, maybe I didn't articulate it um, amazingly. No, you nailed it. I I don't, I don't mind talking about it because I think if I can help somebody, then that, then, then my, my trauma and my, the, 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 you know, my Valley that I went through when I came out on the top, when I, came out on the top, then, um, then that would help if I can help somebody. All right. Last two questions. What is your guilty pleasure? Um, guilty pleasure would be, I, I'm, I love, I love jelly beans. <laughs> You're my first jelly bean guy. I That's love, interesting. Nobody's ever said that. That's great. I, I love what jelly. color. No, I like the, um, I like the assorted ones. Um, <laughs> And I don't, and I don't like pick out, uh, like I like the, it's almost like I'll, I'll take, you know, seven or eight of them and I'll put them in my mouth and it's just like, Ooh, that was a weird combination. But then you, when you get that right combination of like cherry and strawberry and fruit punch, you know, you get that right thing. It's like a burst that I love it. Oh my God. That is so freaking funny. Okay. Last question. We'll change things up a little bit. What one question would you like to ask me? 
I would love, I would love to ask you honestly, uh, and obviously you will be honest. How is it at, before you left for the four months, the conversations that you had with your wife about bringing your daughter, which I believe is she four? She's four. Yeah. Okay. So bringing your four-year-old daughter, you had conversations and you had an expectation and you had a game plan. And how much has that game plan been accurate and how, and, and how has it been thrown off? Well, it's a little difficult to answer the question only because we've been traveling with her um, since she, since my wife was pregnant. So to give you an idea of how much we travel with her, we had to renew her passport because her passport was filled with <laughs> 16 or 17 countries prior to coming here. So we have a lot of experience doing this. Mm -hmm. That said, we've never done four months. Mm -hmm. And that said, I'm only one month into four months. Okay. So with that preamble, here's what I would say. What what we we did the most we could to prepare for what that would be like and the frustrations. What I was unprepared for was things like where I'm staying in Montenegro right now, there's 153 steps mm. um, after you make a vertical mm -hmm. climb to get to those steps, to get <laughs> to the top of the mountain that I am. I can picture you have right a, now. <laughs> okay. When you have a four-year-old that is shot because she's been in the sun all day yep. and you got to make that freaking climb and she says, daddy, I don't want to walk. Yeah. And you have to carry her while you're carrying, um, it's an Airbnb, while you're carrying the water or the groceries or yep. whatever it is up the steps and you're tired and you're irritated and you're sunburned, that's not easy. Yeah. When, when you're, uh, as you know, being in Europe, you know, getting a king size bed isn't as plentiful as the average Marriott, let's say in the States. So your beds are going to be at best, at best, a queen size bed, probably smaller than that in some places. And again, we're going for four months. So we have lots of beds to choose. And when she wakes up and says, I want to come in bed with you. And the three of us are trying to like, you know, hold on to the edges of the bed while she's rolling around. That's not so easy. When you are trying to get some work done, like right now I'm doing this podcast and my wife has got her in another room watching a movie and she wants to come out because I can hear the door rumbling. Mm -hmm. She wants to come out and play with me and she wants to know what I'm doing right now. But yeah. my wife is having to do this and we're ha so there are like, I can go on and so on there's some and ham on. So there's some ham and egg stuff going on and. All that kind of stuff. Yes. You know what I find yes. interesting that just popped mm. up into my head? And since, you, you know, a lot of your listeners are probably entrepreneurs and, and, or, or, or people that are, are want to go down that route. And yeah. it, it's amazing to me how when, cause Shalene and I talk to entrepreneurs all the time and one of their biggest struggles is like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm an expert at. I don't know what to teach. I don't know what I'm like, you literally you, you don't even know this, but you have a, when you said that your daughter has already had to renew her passport, you and your wife could literally write a book about how to travel with young children. And it would probably be a New York times bestseller. And all I want is like 5% commission when you write that book for giving you that idea. And, but you know what I'm saying? Like people, people, <laughs> yes. don't, people don't even realize like how much they've gone through in their life. And if they just sit down and buy a push journal and write down exactly like what they've gone through. And somebody else needs that knowledge. I mean, there, you know how many people out there that would be, that would fight like crazy to get that hands on a book of somebody like your expertise that traveled all through like Europe and even the States and just being traveling with, with a, with an infant, with a two year old, with a four. It's just like, it's a, it's amazing to me out there that people can make money and do a service that really helps people. And I think that's, I think, I think people need to open their, their eyes a little bit more to like, what's just right in front of them. And I love that. That's going to be, uh, after I get off with you, it is, uh, it's now 7 PM here. And I think it's probably 10 AM in your world. Yes. We're going to go out for dinner, have a bottle of wine, and we're going to talk about what you just said. That's super helpful. And if you're open to it, you mentioned earlier 
that you've talked on previous podcasts about getting out of debt and um, making money and investing. Mm -hmm. If you're open to it, I would love uh, at some point over the next couple of weeks, maybe month, whatever, I'd love to jump back on with you and do a part two okay. where we dug deeply into that because a lot of people message me as they've messaged you, I'm sure. And they give me the sort of, it must be nice kind of thing. I wish I could spend four months traveling. I wish I could get out of debt. I wish I could have investments. And I think that they just don't know what to do and how to do it. Let's and do I would it. include myself and in a lot of that. So if you're down for that, I would let's love do it. And to- let's, uh, I'll, I'll give everybody a little teaser on this that you can throw out there. If they, they make sure that they follow and subscribe to your podcast, because when we come back on, I'm going to give them the best tip for their emergency fund that they'll ever get. I found, I found, um, I was just with a group of guys that own a company that they have the best interest rate to park your money. All right. I love it. Well, um, that flew by. Do you have any final words, suggestions, or an ask for the people that are listening? No, I mean, if they, we, we talked a lot about the push journal. And, um, yep. you know, and, uh, you know, obviously if they're listening to you, they trust and, you know, believe in what you're doing. And I think that if they want to go check that out, there's, um, pushjournal.com. I'm sure you can throw that down in the show notes and, um, take a look at them. It's, it's, it's a very, um, it's not like your typical journal. This, this is a journal that will get, get some stuff done and, and move the needle forward for you. I could not agree more. Well, Brett, thank you so much for taking the time. I really, really enjoyed uh, this hour with you. Thank you so much and, and, and happy and safe travels. All right. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode and you know someone that needs some help in either stepping up their work hard game or their play hard game, it would mean the world to me if you shared this podcast with them to help me get this movement out there. So if you like what you heard, head on over to iTunes, take 30 seconds and leave me a five star review and I will be forever grateful. So until the next episode, excuses are over. It's time to live.